Now, here's what's so neat in the passage. That's used to describe Ahab. Do you know what the tone of uh, of Ahab's life was? The next verse says, He not only considered it trivial to commit sin. His approach to sin was, hey, everybody does it. Come on, God understands. God understands. One of the things I find our generation doing is that they use, they take scripture out of context to validate that kind of perspective. His grace is sufficient for me. Come on, every guy is in porn. You know that, right? Woman, ladies, every man, every man in this room, every one of your husbands looks at women as objects. Just suck it up and deal with it. Come on, it's how we are, man. It's, it's how we're created. We're just men. That's what they say. Every woman is ruled by her emotions. Everyone. Everyone lies a, bit, a little bit. Everyone cheats. Come on. God understands. That's what he, that was the tone of his life. That's not, you, bibli- not my idea, biblically, that's not how Jesus feels about sin. That's, right. this, that's his language. That's, that's Ahab's language. We're, we are literally, I don't know if you can, and again, I'm not prophetic, I, I, but you, it would seem like our day and age is, is, is just attacked with the spirit of Ahab. Now, in the passage, I find it interesting that that's how he describes Ahab. You learn about Jezebel. Jesus doesn't say that you have Ahab among you. He says you have Jezebel. And in the passage, you can see Jezebel was a whole nother level even beyond Ahab. He says he not only considered it sin, uh, or not only considered it trivial to commit sin, but he also married Jezebel, who was the vehicle of sin which corrupted. I mean, just took it to a whole nother level. So when Jesus describes sin, he's not saying accidental stuff. What sin is, is absolute utter rebellion against God. It's looking at him saying, I know how you feel about this, and I don't care. Butt out. Back off. I'm doing what I, I'm not, I don't care how you see her. I want to see her the way I want to see her. Now, I still want to go to heaven, you know, and I won't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls who do, and I won't lie, and I won't steal, and I'll wear the right clothes, but hey, butt out of That's what sin is. I know exactly how you feel, but I'm doing the opposite. That's not accident kind of stuff. Now, when you this is really significant because Jesus says, This is what you are tolerating. It's what Jezebel did. And why he's been out of shape is that no one in the family of God would ever tolerate this. He says, I'm speaking to you as a son would speak to a son. You're tolerating rebellion against God. You're tolerating sin. Now Here's the nuts and bolts of what he's dealing with the church on. He's dealing with the consequences of that. The consequences in the passage are not physical. The consequences are spiritual. I I found it strange at first that when he goes down through, he doesn't list all the physical things that, you know, this woman did. He doesn't even give her a physical name. You know, he doesn't talk about, well, remember the, the whole budget crisis and, and remember the guy that she, well, the vacation Bible school, never forget that one. And he, see, he doesn't go through and list all the physical things she does. He talks about the spiritual consequence of tolerating rebellion. And that's given to us specifically in verses 26, 27, and 28, where he brings up authority. He says, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give you authority. And he describes the authority as the authority that he himself has down through the end of verse 27, just as I have received authority from my Father. So the consequence of tolerating sin in your life is that you give away authority. Right. Here's a premise, and again, if you read the scriptures in the New Testament, it's over and over. Satan wants to enslave you, Jesus wants to free you. Right. He who sins is a slave to sin, what Paul says. It's a basic premise. Satan wants to, wants to put you in slavery. He wants to control you. Jesus wants to set you free. You've been free, set free. Be free is what Paul says. Okay? So the consequence of sin is you lose your authority. Okay? You lose your God-given right of authority and freedom as a child of God. I got interested in that, really interested in that. And so I went back and uh, researched this, and, and it led me eventually all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. And Genesis chapter 1, I begin to read about how Adam and Eve, of course, were created. 
And I was amazed, again, that how consistent the Bible is. They were created in phenomenal authority. Phenomenal authority. For example, it says back in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26, that he says, God says, let us create man. Let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. And he created them. So we were created in the image of God. This is unique language. And what you're going to find as we read through this sentence and we read through a few other things, there's language that's applied to us that before humanity, it was only applied to God. That's really important. See, there's language that, that God and we share that no one else has. Okay? We were created in his image. And we'll get some more of that this week. But one of the aspects of being created in his image, in his, in his likeness, is that we were created to rule. Verse 26, let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. We were created to rule. If you trace this out, and I thought this was so neat, angels were not created to rule. We were. And before us, God was it. God ruled. Angels didn't rule. We were created to rule. Why? We're heirs to the throne. We're his children. We're his kids. We were created to rule. And you go down through the passage. I'm just going to touch on these. If you go down to verse, well, 27, we'll skip. But male and female were created with that authority. Verse 28, he says, fill the earth and subdue it. Okay? Subdue means literally bring it under your authority. You're created with phenomenal authority. Bring it under your authority. Verse 29, he says, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the entire earth. It's yours. You're ruling over that. It's yours. He says in verse 30, and this is really graphic. I think it's wonderful. To all the beasts of the earth, all the birds of the air, all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, give to you. That's the authority that mankind were created to walk in. It's phenomenal. Now you come into chapter 2 and this all gets flushed out. For instance, you see Adam ruling over the earth. There's jobs, there's tasks to be done. Adam does those. They're under his authority. For instance, the naming of the animals. God didn't name the animals. Who named the animals? Adam. See, God brings this goat in front of Adam. And says, Adam, what do you think? Adam goes, I'm thinking goat. And goat was his name. Adam did that. Isn't that tremendous? Here's sin. When you come into chapter 3, at mankind, Jesus comes to the church at Thyatira and he says, listen, I'm speaking to you as children would speak to children. If you are a Christian, you are a child of God, period. Jesus says, I'm bent out of shape because you're tolerating what no one in the family would ever tolerate. What are you tolerating? Not mistakes or accidents. You are tolerating rebellion, he says. And the rebellion is not, a, is not a physical consequence. It's a spiritual consequence. You understand everything we do in church on Sunday morning and throughout our lives has spiritual emphasis, not physical emphasis. See, I believe you can, come, I believe you can physically come to church on Sunday morning and yet not come to church on Sunday morning. See, I believe you can physically come and sing and yet not participate in worship. You can physically give money and never tithe. We're going to talk about some of those things this week. It's not physical. Okay? It's spiritual. That there's this intimacy, there's this connection, there's this indwelling of his spirit. Christians aren't just people who do physical things or look physically better. They're in an intimate relationship with the Father filled by his, the spirit of his son. That's what makes you a Christian, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So when he's talking to the church, he's talking to Thyatira, he says, listen, you're tolerating sin, which is spiritual. And the, the spiritual consequence of sin is you lose what Adam was walking in. When Adam sinned, you see in, from chapters 1 and 2 this drastic change. You come into chapter 3, he's not ruling over the earth, the lions, the tigers, the bears. <laughs> We're so American. Okay? He, he's not ruling over the animals. He's being chased by those animals. Okay? Mankind is afraid of bears, afraid of lions. I'll tell you some stuff about Luther tonight. It's really interesting, his perspective on all that. But he's, he, in chapter 3, 
he loses his authority. Which again, if you talk about sin, most non-Christians and even some in the church, when you talk about the first sin, they say, oh yeah, yeah, Adam and Eve, they ate this apple. Well, yeah, fine, they ate an apple, I'm cool with that. But that's not the full story. It was a spiritual deal. In fact, I'm going to propose to you that Satan is going to come at you just exactly the way that he came at Adam and Eve. See, he did not come to Adam and Eve and said, hate God. He does not do that. He's not going to come and say, worship me. He, does, he's, he never approaches a child of God like that. You, do never find, you never find someone in the church like Bertha, who's been serving the Lord for 80 years, you never find out that suddenly she becomes a satanic high priest. Hey, have you seen Bertha? She's been sacrificing goats. Did you hear about that? Oh, yeah, she's a satanic high priest now. Okay. That just does not happen. Satan's not going to come to you like that. You say, how is he going to come to me? He's going to come to you the way he came to Adam. He came to Adam and he said, hey, Adam, this is who you are. It's awesome. This is your authority. This is your reign. This is how God set everything up. It's awesome. And do that. You need to do that. Do that, Adam. But there's one thing I want to, I want to propose to you. This is God's role for the tree and life in your position. What if you just saw it like this? And when you buy into that, he gets you. Here's how it happens in our day. God comes to us, and I said this this morning, and it's been, it seems like it's everywhere. I've noticed it more with kids. We live in a sexually perverse nation and world where not only men see women as objects, women see themselves as objects. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. We're even finding in the cartoons, we have to filter that out so, so carefully. Satan's going to come to you and say, uh, you can go to church. Hey, yeah, tithe. You need to be a part of that. You want to go to heaven? Absolutely. But this is how God sees women. This is how God sees sexuality. This is how God ordained. What, what if you just saw it like this? You can still come to church on Sunday, you know. But what if you just saw it like this? And when you bite into that, he's got you. Right. And he gain, what happens, you lose your authority to him just like Adam did. Now you're going to say, well, how do you know that you're going to lose your authority? I had stumbled on this. The temptation of Jesus is told in three Gospels. Luke's Gospel is unique, and I never caught it before. When Satan comes to Jesus, he came after Jesus just like he came after Adam. Jesus, or Adam was a man without sin before he, was, uh, before he fell. Jesus was a man without sin when Satan tempted him. As Satan went after the first Adam, he goes after the second. And in Luke chapter 4, if you want to pop that up for us, brother, Satan comes to Jesus, and listen to what this says. The devil leads Jesus up to a high place and shows him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. This is what he says. Check this out. I will give you all of their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to whoever I want to. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, what bonehead gave Satan that authority? You did. And I did. And Adam did. Because what sin is, is not some physical mistake that you do. Sin is, you give satanic authority in the area of your life. For example, when Satan comes and says, God sees women like this. God sees finances like this. See, God sees like this. What if you see it like this? What you do is say, hey, I still want to come to church on Sunday, God. I love you. I believe in you. I believe the story. I want to go to heaven. Hell doesn't sound great. I want to go to heaven. But keep your nose out of my sex life. And Satan, I give you authority in this area of my life. I want you to move in my life, and I want every aspect of my sexual being to come underneath your authority. Come in my home. Crawl in bed with my wife and kids. Overshadow my end. That's what happens when you sin. Now, again, no one ever knows that. Adam didn't know that. Satan doesn't come to you and say, I want authority in your life. He is a liar. And whether you know it or not, when you sin... That's what you're doing. And again, I didn't say this this morning, but we're going to get to a lot of this tonight. Say, just as Christianity is not about doing physically right things, belonging to the enemy is not just about doing physically wrong things. Right. Jesus doesn't just want you to do the right things. He wants you to become the right person. Amen. Satan doesn't want you to just do the wrong things. He wants you to be a spitting image of himself. 